Thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me to this workshop. Um, we at IBM have been working on this uh, infrastructure, the neural tissue simulator, for about uh, 10 years. And I'm going to share with you uh, what we've uh, accomplished in that time. In particular, uh, I'll tell you about why we consider this an ultra-scalable solution uh, to the problem of neural tissue simulation. And in addition, I'm going to talk about how it allows you to specify and solve arbitrary model graphs over uh, a complex neural tissue topology. So what do I mean by model graphs? Uh, I would argue that um, almost all models that we create in computational neuroscience can be uh, represented as directed acyclic graphs of models which are communicating with one another. And this is a, an old uh, way of viewing parallel computation in general, um, except for the most simple, uh, simple, simplest models, which um, can be viewed as, as, as single nodes. Um, I think uh, more complex network models ultimately can be decomposed in this way. Into acyclic, de yeah, acyclic, which, which may be confusing, but I think I'll, I'll explain to you why, though networks themselves are highly recurrent, in order to compute the network, you need to decompose it into an acyclic graph because dependencies in computation can only go in one direction, right? You have a left-hand side and a right-hand side. So this is what I mean by acyclic. Um, so in, in the process of giving this presentation, I'll address three major questions, which I think might be relevant to the objectives of this overall uh, two-day workshop. One, how do we specify these graphs arbitrarily? And we, we, uh, we have a, one solution to that, which I'll share with you. Secondly, uh, how do we simulate neural tissue itself as a model graph, and, and that goes to your question, how, how can that be, that, that a, a neural tissue is an acyclic graph? Um, and, and I'll try to address that uh, and, and share with you how we did that with the neural tissue simulator. And then, and then finally, I actually uh, will start with an answer to this question, how do we best compute um, a neural tissue model graph? And um, when, I, when I say best, I, 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 um, I'm implying that there is a, a, a particular machine architecture that we're targeting. So at IBM, we, we conducted an experiment, which was the, uh, the use of the uh, model graph simulator to simulate neural tissue with a very specific decomposition, which I'll share with you. Uh, and that decomposition dictates then how to map the computation onto a parallel architecture such as BlueGene. So much like er Eric did in his introductory comments, I'm going to describe what, what we mean by neural tissue simulation. And we know from sort of a, a long history dating back to the middle of the last century that we all started with Hodgkin and Huxley and single compartment models, which themselves were multi-scale in that they were aggregates of channels that were simulated in this single model of a compartment. People very quickly started to compose fiber models uh, at IBM and other places, uh, Cooley and Dodge, for example, uh, which connected these single compartment models together uh, through fixed uh, axial resistance or conductance. These can then be solved as branch structures, uh, the work of Heinz and, and others, Traub, um, to give rise to full neuron compartmental models. We're familiar with the concept of neural networks. This is a B tree network from the work of Turing. Um, what typically is done to s approximate neural, uh, neural or neuronal networks is to incorporate models of synapses in these neural networks and to perhaps embed within them uh, compartmental models of neurons, which then are coupled across these synapses. What neural tissue simulation does is augments sort of these constraints which we inherit from this, this long history of modeling. And uh, the previous constraints themselves uh, in, in our definition of neural tissue simulation that are included. That is, uh, we use multi-compartment Hodgkin and Huxley models of neurons uh, derived from, in this case, anatomically reconstructed uh, neurons. Uh, we try to replicate a diversity of neuron and synapse types, really an arbitrary diversity because that's what we observe in, in real neural tissue. And we uh, couple these neurons together through uh, synapses which attempt to match synaptic distri distributions from real tissue. None of this is new, right? And, and in fact, um, the additional constraints that I'll share with you now uh, have been used in many other simulators and simulation infrastructures and approaches as well. But we think this is what distinguishes neural tissue simulation in that every model in the simulation is embedded within some three-dimensional coordinate system of the tissue. So you have to have that in order to really begin to approximate the tissue. And I think Eric uh, addressed that and implied that in his introductory comments. The coordinates for these models are then available 
during initialization and simulation themselves so that you can compute over coordinates which are beyond the single neuron or the single elements of the, of the, of the network but instead refer to the coordinate system of the tissue. And in this way, model dependencies and the communication between models and their calculation itself can depend upon these coordinates. And this, I think, is very uh, uh, useful in, in, in a variety of modeling approaches. One that has been used in, in the case of the Blue Brain Project and one which I contributed to uh, in the last, you know, in the middle of the last decade uh, in the Blue Brain Project was that of detecting contacts between neurons in this three-dimensional coordinate system in order to provide a basis for synapse creation at points of touch uh, between neurons. So this is one way in which the model dependencies uh, can, be, can be based on these coordinates. In, the, in this case, the geometry of the neuron dictates where synapses are created in the tissue. Some advantages and, and things we can derive from these additional constraints. One, we can constrain synapses, as I mentioned, based on tissue geometry. We can, for, for example, facilitate models of other than synaptic interactions, as Eric uh, addressed, for example, of faptic interactions between neurons. Uh, we can facilitate models of extracellular phenomena, such as uh, drug and neuromodulator diffusion, uh, injury effects such as spreading depression. And we can also, uh, using this uh, coordinate system, facilitate forward models of larger uh, scale phenomena, such as EEG, MEG, and BOLD. But we've identified op emerging opportunities using this approach, and, and the ones shown in yellow are ones that we've been actively uh, uh, addressing in our, in, our, in our lab. One is widespread gap junctional coupling, which is in its sense just a network phenomenon, but I think because of the way in which gap junctions are computed, it, it lends itself more to a, a tissue simulation, and I'll share with you why in, in the specific example of the inferior olive. Um, tissue and circuit development, something Eric mentioned, is, is something we're actively looking at in, in order to insert neurons into a, a tissue uh, in a way that's, that's reasonable, that um, uh, allows the neuron to accommodate to the tissue environment in which, it, in which it's growing or in which it has been, uh, you know, w from which it's been extracted. Uh, and, and ultimately, deep brain stimulation is another uh, target area for application, and I would refer you to the work of McIntyre for a very nice uh, piece of work which looks at fibers in uh, real uh, patients and fiber tracks as measured through DTI and approximates with Hodgkin-Huxley models the effects of the extracellular fields uh, generated by a deep brain stimulator. So this is one way in which multi-scale modeling has already been used in a clinical setting. Um, and we're looking at that application with the neural tissue simulator. So the questions that I raised in my introduction, that is uh, how to specify arbitrary model graphs how to specify neural tissue as a model graph and how to decompose it and compute it, they're all interrelated. So my talk is going to address them uh, sometimes together, sometimes in, out of order. In this case, uh, I'm talking uh, about the question of axons, which is really about neural tissue and how to, how to represent it in a simulator that, that uses the model graph abstraction. But it also is intimately related to computation. And I think, I think you'll understand why in a minute. So many simulations don't include axons, and this is reasonable in, in the sense that axons are all or nothing uh, in their conduction of action potentials and in the way we think about them and, and the way they're typically modeled. And so messages can simply be passed on a parallel machine to represent when a spike has occurred so that the postsynaptic neuron can accommodate that. Um, and this is, you know, uh, described in, in this review for the Blue Brain Project um, where processors on the blue gene now, uh, which was used to simulate um, the, the cortical column act like neurons and these processors are shown in red the coupling between the processors on the blue gene or the nodes is in yellow and a rack of blue gene is shown in the lower left quadrant um, connections between the processors then act like axons so this this is a very natural way to think about decomposing a neural tissue onto a parallel machine and it implies that in some way the brain is oops the brain is a supercomputer, right? Or that at least there's, a, there's an analogy between it. The neurons are processors and the connections and axons are like the network of the neuron. And I would argue that that's not necessarily, right, um, an obvious analogy. It doesn't have to be that the most uh, uh, natural decomposition is, is, is the right one or, or, or that it's the only one. And in fact, there are many decompositions that one could imagine for uh, mapping brain tissue onto a parallel machine. Uh, s some uh, include higher levels, right, in terms of multi-scale column level uh, decompositions or microcircuit level. At lower levels, we can think about compartments themselves. 
as being entities that could be mapped onto processors, or at the very lowest level that we typically think of in neuroscience, you know, we don't go down to the atomic level, there is the EM, right? Where neurons themselves don't really appear. We see instead this uh, gamish of, of compartments and different uh, pieces and elements of the tissue all the way down to mitochondria. Um, and this, this level actually is the one that I'm going to uh, focus on. So what we've done with the neural tissue simulators is, is taken this question of decomposing uh, the calculation of neural tissue, which I think is intimately related to multi-scale modeling in general, because ultimately you want to cal calculate uh, what you're modeling in an efficient way. Um, and so partly this is the reason why IBM is interested in, in, in this type of an experiment, which is to, to ask questions about what's the best decomposition for the machines you know, IBM is building. And, and I think it's, it's a common architecture that is that of a, a massively parallel machine uh, uh, such as blue gene. And the decomposition we chose, again, is, is one which is best exemplified by the EM level, where a tissue volume now uh, comprising um, fibers, which pass through some fixed rectangular prism, which themselves uh, you know, are cut at the boundaries of that prism. All fibers within that are mapped onto a node of blue gene. And I'm not saying that we're doing a field approximation of the tissue or that in some way we're dispensing with neurons. We're not. The neurons are there, they're just cut, and they're, they're spanning multiple processors. And so what this does is it imposes the coordinate system of the tissue onto the machine. So now the machine is basically a domain decomposition of the tissue and not a, a set of neurons coupled across the machine communication architecture. So this was, this was the goal, this was the vision, and we, we thought this might be a reasonable approach for something uh, which is very close to, um, uh, to the hearts of many in parallel computing, which is scaling. Can you scale your, uh, your system and your, and your simulation up? And in terms of scaling, there are different types of scaling. One is known as strong scaling. And in strong scaling, you take the, the number of nodes on the machine and you increase it while maintaining the size of the calculation uh, constant. And so you see whether or not you get a speed up and this is useful if, if your goal is to speed up your calculation. And, and in the case of the neural tissue simulator, we saw a very good speed up on a blue gene P with a 16,000 neuron simulation with 1,000 compartments per neuron. And in this case, the synapses were uh, on the order of 10,000 synapses, conductance space synapses, ampla and GABA per neuron. This, co this compares then to work done with parallel neuron by Heinz and, and colleagues. Um, uh, I think reasonably well. There's, there's a, an argument to be made that our simulator is on the same order uh, of, of speed given these, given these numbers. We use gap junctions in our simulations, so it might, it might be best mapped to the second curve in Heinz's plot. But of course there are differences, and so I don't really want to dwell on, on comparing the two. I just wanted to, to make the case that our strong scaling results are comparable. What instead I want to focus on in terms of scaling is uh, other benefits of this volume decomposition and, and how mapping the tissue coordinates uh, of, of the models, which ultimately comprise uh, our model graph, um, into the processors of blue gene on a, on a, on a, a volume by volume basis and how that um, affects two other types of scaling. But in order to describe that, I just wanted to drive home the point that in this case, the compartments of the neurons shown on the left are divided among four processors represented by this, this 2D slicing scheme. And the different colors represent where compartments in this case are mapped. And you can see at the volume boundaries, which would be a blow up of the intersection of these two cuts, uh, where the, the different models representing the compartments or the branches need to then communicate, shown in the lower right, communicate in order to solve, in this case, the Gaussian elimination which is required to, to solve the dendritic voltage in, for example, Heinz's approach. So keeping this in mind, uh, I also want to point out that this very small green structure in the upper left quadrant of the lower right figure is a synapse. Okay, so, so where's the communication? It's not between synapses. It's not within synapses, right? That synapse is entirely within a single node of the machine. And in fact, almost all of our synapses are within a single node of the machine. So synapses are simply you know, uh, 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 ordinary differential equations that couple compartments with a presynaptic or postsynaptic 
component in order to perturb the voltage of the postsynaptic side, in this case, AMPA and GABA, for example. And so no communication occurs uh, in terms of MPI or, or the machine itself uh, for synapse so, uh, s solutions. Instead, the communication is, is fixed. It's at a fixed density because we know the EM cross-sectional area of, of number of branches or number of cut fibers per unit area, right? We know that. That's been known since EM was invented. And it's really pretty much constant across all animals. So we kind of already know the communication requirements for this type of simulation, even if we don't have the connectome. Right? So this is, this is one argument as to why uh, the volume decomposition might be uh, something to look at. Um, yes? Clarification. So then you're explicitly computing the action potential propagation? That, that goes back to the, the slide about axons, which is that we do simulate the axons. Okay. Yeah, and, and I, I failed to drive home that point. You're right. So the axons then become part of the Hodgkin-Huxley solution. Mm -hmm. And we have no thresholds then. There's no logical operator if something exceeds a threshold. Instead, we're stepping forward continually a set of ODEs which are coupled in this way in our model graph. Though the axons could be logical, you know, logical spike passing entities, we just haven't implemented them that way. Yep. Was there another question? I don't see how in the synapses, or most of them can be in the bulk of the volume, because the surface volume ratio of your domain must be quite large. So lots of the synapses should occur on the surface, and therefore be spanning domain. So in a, so, so in a, a tissue, um, <clears throat> in a tissue that's four millimeters by two millimeters by two millimeters, we map that onto, say, a, um, a 36 by 36 by 36 partitioning of the of the system. So the surface to, air, to volume ratio isn't so bad. The system automatically deals with those that do span boundaries. And what I'd like to point out in a second is why even that doesn't worry us. But first, let me just point out that synapse scaling, what we call synapse scaling, something not, not really in the computer science domain, but we think relevant to, to comp computational neuroscience. In this plot, we show that as we grow the number of synapses per neuron in these simulations, and this simulation has uh, 250,000 neurons now on 1,024 nodes of blue gene P, from zero synapses per neuron to 12,000, right? We span four orders of magnitude increase in synapses. The, the, the speed up, I'm sorry, the slowdown uh, in our computation is, is less than 10. It's really close to like a doubling, which, um, you know, is, is I think, uh, well, you know, it's, it's important to note, at least, that this, this demonstrates how synapses aren't really uh, about communication in our simulator. They're about computation, and, and it's pretty light. Okay, these are full conductance-based synapses as well, AMP and, and GABA, and so they are updated on every integration time step of the dendrite. These are not spaced out according to some assumed synaptic delay, uh, as, is, as is often the case with logical spike passing. Um, um, yes? What kind of circuit do you simulate? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going out of order. I'm trying something new because I want to get to sort of the way the graph is specified as being the crux of this, this talk, since that's what the, what the, the, uh, what the workshop is about, is, is specifying models and, and multi-scale models. But, um, but in, in, in short, it's, it's a cortical-like structure, which, which I will describe for you in a minute. But, but to drive home the point about what if synapses found boundaries, or what about these cut fibers, what's the communication cost? Remember, this is nearest neighbor communication on the torus or, the, or any network. It could be a Beowulf cluster or whatever. And so nearest neighbor Im implies that there are fewer hops. In fact, there's one hop on, on a blue gene, uh, which means that the link bandwidth is going to be much greater than, than, say, long distance bandwidth between non-adjacent nodes. And this really is where we get, I think, the most important form of scaling in, in, in this experiment, this, this uh, computer science experiment, which is our weak scaling result. Weak scaling is when you take the size of, of the calculation or the simulation and you grow it at the same time as you grow the size of the machine. And what this implies is, is or, or what it asks is the question, um, if you have a big problem and you're starting small because you only have a small machine available, will you get there? Can you, can you just grow the machine and still compute at the same rate? Because often, you know, depending upon your decomposition, the answer might be no. In this case, we grew the size of the simulation from um, <clears throat> 16,000 neurons, 1,000 compartments each on 64 nodes of blue gene uh, to um, um, over a million neurons, uh, over a billion uh, compartments. and um, uh, 
10 to the 10th synapses uh, on the full 4,000 node uh, machine at, at Watson Labs in uh, Yorktown Heights. And you see the compute time is, 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 if anything, it's improving, which is kind of weird, but it, it's at least flat. So what this, what this suggested to us was we could then project out what kind of a machine would be required to simulate, for example, a liter of tissue, right, a relevant volume. Uh, to, to us because that's about how much we have in our heads um, of neural tissue. So, so with that type of a weak scaling result, we're fairly confident that this solution will continue to scale as machines grow larger over the next decade. And I'll, I'll leave it at that, but that, that's our weak scaling result. Is that feasible? To, so I don't know anything about the machine's internal architectures, but it's your thing, it's a 3D uh, source type? Yeah, and it's actually 5D now on, on Q, and okay. I'm trying to figure out what to do with the other two dimensions, but yeah. So, but does that actually scale physically? When you, with the physical interconnects between the processors, is it possible to maintain that 3D architecture as you fill a room with additional lodines? Yes. Yeah, okay. I mean, that, that's... That's what the whole other side of the building is all about, is, is figuring out how to wire that up and maintain those, those delays. And it's a very, you know, it's a very natural, I think, wiring problem, uh, because it, again, it's nearest neighbor. But you do have <coughs> long distance connections when you wrap around and somehow they, ma somehow they maintain okay. it. Yeah, it's a packaging problem. <coughs> At least with Blue Gene Q, it's a solved problem. And it, it actually has moved from uh, Ethernet type cup, uh, cabling to, to fiber optic for that, partly for that reason to make it um, more reliable. Yeah, I have a question. Yes? Is this special the composition that you're doing on the circuit at uniform grid? Is it at, at a what? A uniform grid. The, the volume decomposition is actually adaptive to the, to the load. Okay. So we create a histogram in three dimensions of <clears throat> the load by mapping the computational cost of all of our models mm -hmm. to the coordinates that they live at, and then, and then equalizing the histogram in three dimensions. So they are rectangular prisms. There could be some l load imbalance, uh -huh. but, um, but that's our approach. So in the end, you have to have the same average number of compartments per, per rectangular section that you have in circuit, right? I wouldn't say the same number of compartments because synapses have a load. Uh, Channels might be distributed non-uniformly, so it, it, it uh, and uh, I'll, I'll allude to that in a minute. But the, it's it's really the uh, computational cost of every model that gets summed at a at a what you might call a compartment. But we're trying to be careful to distinguish compartment variables, which are models, from segments, which are more like topological skeletal elements that the models get targeted to. And I'm gonna, I'm going to kind of emphasize that point in a minute. But basically, this topological skeleton, which is what you see in the light microscope, for example, fibers and touches. You can't see the synapses, right, in, in light microscopes. So think of it as what you see in the light microscope is the topological skeleton. The models then are, are targeted arbitrarily to the skeleton. We can target arbitrary tar synapse models to touches. We can target arbitrary compartment variables to seg branch segments. And all of that then gets summed in terms of computational cost to balance the load. And this, this really gets us to what is the model graph for a neural tissue, you know? So I have also yep. a question. So how about diffusion? Right, so, um, and I will talk about calcium. Uh, we are modeling the intracellular diffusion of calcium along the, along the fiber. And, and I'll tell you why, but we, we handle that um, uh, I was more thinking yeah. about extracellular. Extracellular, um, we've thought about it. Of another form of extracellular communication. Right. So, so where I'm headed with this description of the model graph of a neural tissue is that we have models which we know how to connect. And there's a, a functor, if you will, in our system that goes through a dance to connect channels to compartments and synapses to compartments and compartments to synapses. And there's a, a sort of a set set of connections that have to be made, even if you have arbitrary model types. But the simulator that it's built on top of allows for arbitrary models with arbitrary interfaces. So even though we've imposed this sort of uh, stereotyped connection uh, routine in order to lay down the basic neural tissue that we're familiar with, channels, synapses, and compartment variables, we can also impose uh, a, another uh, um, mesh, if you will, on top of it, which could, for example, be an extracellular mesh. It could be a, a, a set of models which represent finite elements. 
Um, and these could then have standard inter or, or you know, non-standard interfaces, I should say, into the tissue to allow them to, for example, sum uh, currents across channels or provide a, uh, an extracellular field potential, which would then you know, induce a current within the, within the fiber if you, were, if you were simulating something such as deep brain stimulation. And it could also handle reaction diffusion in the extracellular space. But this hasn't been implemented, it's just um, supported by the underlying infrastructure of the model graph simulator. So the model graph simulator is what the neural tissue simulator is built on top of, and it provides a language for expressing model state, uh, the phases of computation, which is how we decompose something which you know, is a model of a, of a, a recurrent system into a directed acyclic graph because we break it into phases. So a single model might have multiple phases of computation, which ultimately means that um, the graph is, is really a graph between model phases as opposed to between models. And that's, that's basically the answer to that question from earlier. There's a language for composing these uh, models into graphs. And under the covers, and this I think is one of the advantages of, of this approach as well, is that we automatically partition the computation for multi-threaded architectures and we automatically generate the communication that's required uh, using MPI in this case to, to, uh, to solve the graph over a parallel uh, architecture such as BlueGene. And so the user doesn't have to, to think about parallelization. So again, the model definition language allows you to specify models, their state, their um, interfaces, their phases. The graph view allows you to compose those models into a graph. Uh, model types themselves are laid out in memory in an efficient way and, and compute it in a multi-threaded uh, um, multi for multi-core architectures. The communication then is between models and their proxies on other processors and so you can imagine the models within a, a node is existing and the proxies as being sort of the fuzzy boundaries of the graph that the, mo that the uh, particular uh, node sees and those fuzzy boundaries in the case of the volume decomposition are those fibers that happen to sort of be on the boundary. And then we have a parameterization of the models which is standard and this allows us to set up state and compute. An example of MDL, the model definition language is shown here. We declare state, in this case for a sodium channel. Uh, these should be familiar variables. We, com we declare connections, what it expects on the pre-node side, in this case a compartment, and it expects a voltage producer. Uh, and in the case of sodium channels, it also expects from another potentially the same connection a sodium concentration producer. So it needs to know the concentration of the intracellular sodium so that it can compute the Nernst potential and, and know its reversal potential. And this is the way we think about it. What does a model need to know? What does it expect when it makes certain types of connections? And what does it produce? That's not shown here, but what does it produce for others to use? And it's the problem of something else in this case, you know, some functor like the tissue functor, which weaves them together and introduces sodium channel meat compartment, and they exchange their interfaces, and 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 the system uh, sort of uh, discovers the appropriate state that it needs to compute over in this way. Obviously, the designer of these models has to be aware of that of that introduction step. Um, yes. Maybe a technical question: um, does it, When you say a compartment, does a compartment does the volume decomposition affect the the shape of the compartments? Do you have a diagonal slice along the edge of that? Does that change? So if you did a different volume decomposition to fly lay, there would be different slicing and therefore different compartments or not? It does. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll emphasize that in the next slide. Um, in short, um, we introduce what are called junctions at branch points. These are separate models which can be solved in one of two ways, implicitly or explicitly. Those junctions then can also be introduced at cut points when we decompose the, the tissue. And so junctions pop up <laughs> when you decompose the tissue in different ways and you will get slightly different results then, um, especially when an explicit junction is in a different place than, than it, it was previously. These are numerical methods issues and issues of accuracy and, um, <clears throat> and we, we, can, we can get into that perhaps after. So Heinz's fully implicit method for solving a neuron is shown on the left. Uh, since that uh, seminal work which gave rise to Neuron in the 80s. Um, he has published a branch-based decomposition where individual branches of a neuron can be solved implicitly. 
What we've drawn upon is the work of Rempe and Chop from Northwestern, uh, <coughs> in particular David Chop, that showed that you can introduce junctions which have explicit predictor corrector numerics associated with them. And uh, it's good to know that numerics in other fields, you know, are, are subjects of investigation as well, right? We want to find new types of numerics to solve our, our problems. And so this is what CHOP is doing. Uh, what we did was we imposed an implicit solution which broke the problem up into branch orders. Uh, we then introduced CHOP's explicit junctions at particular locations in those branch order uh, implicit solutions where every branch is sort of a simple tridiagonal solve. And ultimately, to give rise to this volume decomposition, we allow junctions to then, as I mentioned, be determined by the cut points. And so the, the stride at which explicit junctions are introduced is fixed. This limits us to a certain number of phases of computation. But where specifically the explicit junctions exist depends upon where you cut. Okay, so I don't want to dwell too much on this, but this is how we made the uh, solution uh, work in the volume decomposition such that now the model graph specification, the model specification for something like a branch includes uh, a certain number of forward solve, or I'm sorry, forward eliminate phases and back substitute phases, right, which is just Gaussian elimination now, you know, turned inside out uh, in, our own, in our own model definition language. So this is what phases look like in our graph specification language. And this allows you then, as a, as a user of the tool, to weave in to the existing phase structure of a simulation other computations. For example, the finite element model solution of extracellular diffusion might need to be performed right, in different phases that have very specific order, uh, a very specific order relative to other phases that have already been implemented in the neural tissue simulator, and that's supported. So from our graph view of what a neural tissue looks like, you have a node, which is a Hodgkin-Huxley voltage branch, for example. It has interfaces that it produces, for example, uh, for a sodium channel, and interfaces that it expects from a sodium channel. I'm not going to read all of these. They should be familiar to you. Similarly, an AMP receptor would produce certain interfaces, and a, a connexon, which would be one half of a gap junction, would produce certain interfaces. Um, in addition, we support an extracellular medium node, which could then become a, a mesh. Uh, this produces concentrations of various ion species, temperature. So it's a very natural way to start to add components, which are, in, in, in a sense, not connected by the user. This tissue functor simply knows how to connect channel types, synapse types, but you can augment them with new interfaces. Right? So a different type of ion species doesn't have to be a, a major change in the underlying architecture. It's just something that the models are aware of. Um, and then the synapse obviously has a presynaptic side, so you can see that here, which is communicating ultimately with this other voltage branch. Okay? And as I mentioned, these are all targeted to the scaffolding of the topological skeleton, which is what you see in the light microscope, and that's what gets loaded in first, right? It's basically the structural data. Models themselves are associated with structural elements. Um, I, I should also note that in this decomposition, what we've come to understand is that a synapse is a model that takes you from one topological entity's compartment variables to another topological entity's compartment variables, whereas a channel takes you, um, a channel model takes you from one topological entity's compartment variables back to the same topological entity's compartment variables. Though those sets might not be overlapping of compartment variables, the topological entities are uniquely, I think, specified in this way. So, you may, you may be familiar with the paper we published last year on this uh, simulator. Um, it, it included this cortical simulation, which I will describe in a moment. But before I get to that, I'm, I'm forced to tell you about sort of our next modeling objective, which is more scientific. It's not simply for demonstration purposes, which is a model of the inferior olive. And the reason I'm forced to tell you about it is that it, it posed a problem for us, and it, it demonstrates what we mean by an extensible modeling infrastructure. The problem is that the inferior olive has calcium channels, and it has calcium-dependent channels. And we had only modeled voltage. And so we had to extend our infrastructure to accommodate multiple compartment variables. And now we're at a stage where it can accommodate arbitrary compartment variables. And what I mean by that is now we have voltage and calcium. Right? Originally, we had Hodgkin and Huxley voltage 
branches. Now we have calcium concentration branches, and these are all sort of targeted to the same topological entity known as a branch. The solution that I described to you earlier involves Rempe and Chop's explicit junctions. This is our solver. Uh, these are the interfaces for how we solve across branches and subsequent junctions. And to address your question, Eric, just as this set of models solves reaction diffusion in the sense of currents, right? Currents are the, sp are the species which are diffusing and they're reacting based on uh, voltage channels, <laughs> channels that pass currents. Um, we are now able to simulate diffusion of calcium, right? And it's the same solver, so we're reusing the same solver and we anticipate this will be probably the easiest way to go for all reaction diffusion that you might want to simulate over the topological um, uh, structure of the tissue. No, I didn't follow that, I'm sorry. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm trying to describe is that we have a graph of models which um, are coupled together in a specific way to implement Gaussian elimination. Right. And that, that, in the sense of, of voltage, is how we solve for the voltage in every compartment. And what's really diffusing is current, in a sense. So it is a reaction diffusion problem, but it's, it's something, you know, it's, we don't tend to think of it that way. Numerically, it's equivalent. And so what we've done is reuse this same model graph architecture for the forward solution and back substitution, or forward substitution, back, back, uh, backward elimination of Gaussian elimination. We've reused it for solving any compartment variable. And the reason why we, we implemented this sort of arbitrary s compartment variable um, uh, capability is because we wanted to solve for calcium. Now most simulations just model calcium as being something that diffuses across the membrane and gets sucked up by buffers. And that's probably fine because buffering is so intense. But in our infrastructure we, we, we implemented it as a full solution including axial diffusion because it was easier. Um, um, so someone says that, okay, I really want to look at shell diffusion as well as that. Okay, that's a great question. So if you go back to here, you see that, okay, so you see that we added calcium, and I've represented it as an arbitrary number of compartment variables that can be targeted to the same topological entity. A shell then just becomes another instance of a, a calcium concentration compartment variable, which is then coupled to the adjacent one to represent sort of the diffusive uh, cu coupling towards the center. Okay, so with calcium we now have the capability to model all of our channels for the inferior olive uh, as well as other things that we anticipate such as NMDA receptors. And while this looks you know, wickedly complex, um, again none of these connections are specified by the user. Right? You just have to know what the interfaces are that this channel expects and that it produces, and the tissue functor steps you through this choreographed set of introductions between all the models, and what you end up with is something that, you know, you can explore and say, oh yes, NMDA receptors depend upon voltage, but they produce both a voltage and a calcium concentration because they pass calcium, right? And so it, it all makes sense, but you don't have to specify it at this level. I'm just, I'm just illustrating how, um, you know, how complex the graph gets very rapidly as you add more and more model types to these categories of compartment variables, channels, and receptors. Okay. So now I'm going to address your question regarding what we were simulating with that million neuron simulation for the paper last year in, in, in uh, Frontiers in Neuroinformatics. And what we did uh, was we exercised the system. Basically, the workflow involves taking structural models, for example, SWC files from neuromorpho.org, arranging them in some three-dimensional coordinate system of the tissue, in this case to create a mini column, which in comprised th 20 neurons uh, from Dr. Markham's lab. They are shown here. Uh, they were positioned according to the layer in which you would expect to find them at the proportions you would expect between excitatory and inhibitory neurons. But it's by no means uh, you know, a blue brain type simulation. It's, it's very crude compared to blue brain, but we did attempt to, uh, to, to preserve some biological fidelity. Our target was a view such as this, which is a very beautiful image from Micheva's work, uh, where we would include branches uh, and again GABA and AMPA synapses at the conductance level. Uh, we took these mini columns and we 
randomly rotated every neuron to create unique mini columns in that sense uh, to uh, arrange them in 20 by 20 arrays of mini columns which would comprise a column and then we did something which is a travesty in, in neuroanatomy we, we stacked these columns in three dimensions instead of two and the reason we did that was the neural tissue simulator is really about a volume decomposition in three dimensions and so we wanted to exercise it in that, in that regime um, in order to measure scaling um, and so what we ended up with as I mentioned was a simulation of a million neurons roughly a billion um, compartments and, and 10 billion synapses um, in addition we have the capability as I mentioned to to study neural development and we're using this in the creation of glomeruli in the inferior olive but what we what we can do we didn't we didn't do this in in, um, in the cortical simulation of a million neurons but we did do it uh, for a single column for 8,000 neurons we were able to grow uh, the axons in this case parameterized to be attracted to cell bodies and you can see that the result is a, is a lamination of the axonal plexus that was sort of surprising um, and that was strictly for demonstration purposes but again we can target force fields to individual elements of the tissue in order to allow us to perhaps use uh, these neurons which are derived from different animals to insert them into a, tish a single tissue in, in some way that they can actually influence each other's structure uh, perhaps the best solution though is to take them all from the same <laughs> tissue as Eric was describing. Contact detection is the next step after we compose the tissue in this way we detect all of the touches between them and this was an architecture that we came up with uh, for the Blue Brain project again in the last decade where we first uh, hit upon the volume decomposition where now contacts are detected within a volume. Okay, So this speeded up the problem of circuit building tremendously by allowing us to detect contacts within a volume we simply reapplied that volume decomposition and and what is now third-party code to, to the problem of decomposing uh, the tissue uh, and and the computation of the physiology of the tissue in contact detection we've we've since optimized it to run multi-threaded on blue gene p and its four core compute nodes so that we can now con compute roughly 10 billion contacts per hour of, of uh, machine time Another element that is important in the initialization of these simulations is to be aware that every, every topological element, in this case a branch segment for example, has a key associated with it which the user can play with. Okay, so there you get, in this case, 64 bits and you can, you can divide it up into different fields which mean different things. And this allows you then to target models to this topological skeleton arbitrarily. Uh, we, we borrowed some of the terminology from Blue Brain to just for demonstration to show that you can have a layer field, an M-type field, an E-type field, branch type, branch order, and all the way down to segment, branch, and neuron index. Um, this field then gets efficiently uh, masked depending upon a user specification. For example, to target compartment variables, you might say, um, I'm going to target compartment variables based on branch type. And so your mask then becomes branch type, shown in blue. Uh, the branch types are 0 through 3, and you can see that uh, the soma and the dendrites all are targeted with voltage and calcium, but the axon is only targeted with voltage because you don't want to compute calcium in the axon. It's irrelevant, at least in certain simulations. So you can do that, and this is where the costs are specified to give rise to the histogram. In the channel targeting, we can similarly say, well, I want to tra target channels according to branch types. So for an inferior olive model, we might target the soma with sodium and potassium uh, targeted to voltage, whereas uh, high threshold calcium and calcium dependent potassium is targeted to both voltage and calcium for both the dependent and the production side of the connection. Uh, in addition, we, we allow uh, parameters to be targeted based on this masked, uh, in this case, branch type, so that you can have a different conductance for sodium in the cell. And, the, and these are things that you're used to in neuron. I'm just showing that we're, we're supporting it similarly. And, and furthermore, it's, it's not on a model-by-model a, a model basis with, within the graph. It's more at this very high-level specification where it, it, it's applied uniformly throughout the tissue based on this specification. Okay, even though you can mask down to the individual neuron with a file such as this. 
And these are the results we got from our cortical simulation. And this just shows that we're able to get overshooting action potentials in the axons. There was no noise generating input. These were all based on synaptic inputs. We had a high sodium conductance so that we had a lot of spontaneous activity. And so all of this activity you see is, is purely generated by the synapses uh, as well as the endogenous uh, sodium firing. Uh, these were simulations of a million neurons. Uh, on the bottom are 16 million neurons where we varied uh, <coughs> the, um, the number of synapses. And you can see across the dendrite soma and axons the difference in the, um, the recording. And I'd like to finish up by talking again about this next stage in our, our work, which is trying to apply the simulator to something more of a scientific question. <coughs> But uh, I, I sort of bring this approach up, which we call brain systems computation, to, to, um, to address how, how we're, we think about the problem of multi-scale modeling, at least in terms of uh, g growing your simulation to larger and larger tissue sizes. And the problem we view uh, brain systems computation as is one of starting with a whole brain structure, such as the inferior olive, that you can compute given you know, a current resource, such as a rack of blue gene P. <coughs> And then adding brain system components, you know, as other whole brain structures. So you avoid boundary effects within the structure, and you add them in a very specific way. Ultimately, you scale the system up as compute resources grow, and, and we know, you know, probably where they'll grow to over the next decade, so you can plan out. Um, but in intervening in these steps, I think it's important to note, it's, it's important that the um, <coughs> phenomena you validate against um, for this sort of stepwise addition of larger and larger uh, pieces of tissue or larger and larger structural components should be phenomena that emerge prior to some non prestatable um, input. And what I mean by that is basically inputs are the, this, the state space over which your model is solved. And if you don't know the inputs, it's very difficult to validate your model. And so in the case of the inferior olive, we're starting with something that has intrinsic dynamics that we can validate against, even though those are modulated by, for example, inhibitory inputs from the DCN. But we don't, go, we don't want to validate the model based on those inputs because we don't know what they are. And this is a really fundamental problem, we think, in, in, in large-scale you know, tissue simulation in general, is that often we don't know what the inputs are. And with that, you, you can't really state the space in which you're, you're, you're solving your model. So if it's possible to iterate out in this way, you know, we, uh, we, we would like to you know, pursue it, and that is to continually add larger and larger pieces of tissue that in and of themselves constitute some intrinsic dynamics that you can validate against, where the inputs then are modulatory and unknown, but the, uh, the intrinsic phenomena are, are um, sufficient for validation purposes. And so again, the inferior olive is, is a very nice structure. It has about 24,000 neurons, which we think we can fit on a, a blue gene P, and it has these intrinsic emergent properties. Uh, and I'm going to I'm going to finish in, in in one more slide. Where we are currently is we've implemented the channel models from Schweighoffer, Doya, and Kawato, and these models now are running in the neural tissue simulator to give results such as this, which involve sodium spikes in the axons shown in blue along the bottom, a large uh, plateau potential on the dendrites, and calcium concentrations that at least uh, for a first uh, simulation are, are, are reasonable. We're currently scaling this out and, um, and validating. The questions we aim to address, what are, what are the effects of electrotonic coupling between IO neurons? How is this coupling modulated? And what role do the phenomena observed in the IO ultimately play in these overarching cerebral systems? So in closing, Going back to the three questions I started with, I hope I've, I've left you in the workshop with, with uh, some potential candidate answers. Uh, how do we specify arbitrary model graphs? graphs? Um, in our case, we, we do this by model definition followed by graph specification. We have a language for I, either of those. How do we simulate neural tissue as a model graph? In this case, it's a topological tissue skeleton which is, becomes the target for models uh, connected through standard interfaces. But we also support um, the accessing of these models through arbitrary interfaces, which um, are non-standard interfaces, which can, can be, for example, models of the extracellular space or, or other phenomena in the tissue. And finally, how do we best compute or decompose a neural tissue model graph? In our case, we, we've observed 
very good weak scaling um, using a volume decomposition. And there may be additional benefits in terms of modeling. If you have all your models from a particular region of tissue in a single node, uh, it may be easier to collect data, it may be easier to add models in such a decomposition. So we would ad advocate for that. I just want to acknowledge my collaborator, John Wagner, who is uh, 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 the math mathematician on the, pr on the project who in implemented this, um, this uh, novel uh, numerical solution which made the volume decomposition possible, and Charles Peck who was the chief architect on the model graph simulator and my manager. So finally I'll leave you with this statement. The neural tissue simulator software is experimental. IBM would like to create an active user community. Interested groups are therefore encouraged to contact the authors if you're interested in using the tool and we will do our best to resolve all the licensing issues with third-party code and finally make it public. So thank you.